Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, August the 18th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father. Heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, Eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, This has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, for the sake of the one who informed you, and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the Church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or to shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, continuing Article 4. This would be our second part of six, as it turns out. And they are going to be speaking about the doctrine of justification as our adversaries 
uh, understand it, and then we will go into uh, what is wrong with that and the true biblical understanding of justification. So we're beginning Article 4 in paragraph 17. Yet the adversaries do not pass by Christ completely. They require a knowledge of the history about Christ. They credit him by writing that from his merit, a way of life is given to us, or as they say, first grace, prima gratia. They understand that this is a habit, inclining us to love God more readily. Yet what they credit to this habit is of little importance, for they imagine that the human will's acts are the same before and after this habit. They imagine that the will can love God, but nevertheless, this habit simulates it, stimulates it to love more cheerfully. They tell us, first merit this habit by your earlier merits. Then they tell us we should merit an increase of this habit in life eternal by the works of the law. In this way, they bury Christ so that people may not benefit from him as a mediator and believe that they freely receive forgiveness of sin and reconciliation for his sake. They let people dream that by their own fulfillment of the law, they merit forgiveness of sins, that by their own fulfillment of the law, they are counted righteous before God. However, the law is never satisfied since reason does nothing except certain civil works. In the meantime, a person neither fears God nor truly believes that God cares. Although they speak about this habit, God's love cannot exist in a person without the righteousness of faith, nor can his love be understood. They make up a distinction between due merit and true complete merit, meritum congrui and meritum congdigni. This is only a tactic so that they do not appear to agree openly with the Pelagians. If God must give grace for the due merit, it is no longer due merit, but a true duty and complete merit. They do not know what they are saying. After this habit of love is in a person, they imagine that such a person can gain merit in a wholly deserving way, de condigno. Yet they tell us to doubt whether there is a habit present. Therefore, how do they know whether they gain merit in merely an agreeable way or wholly deserving way, de congruo or de condigno? This whole matter was made up by idle men. They did not know how forgiveness of sins happens and how by God's judgment and the terrors of conscience, trust in works is driven out of us. Secure hypocrites always judge that they gain merit in a wholly deserving way, whether the habit is present or is not present, because people naturally trust in their own righteousness. But terrified consciences waver and hesitate. Then they seek and heap up other works in order to find peace. Such consciences never think that they gain merit in a wholly deserving way, and they rush into despair unless they hear, in addition to the teaching of the law, the gospel about free forgiveness of sins and righteousness of faith. So the adversaries teach nothing but righteousness of reason, or certainly about the law. They see the law just like the Jewish people see Moses' veiled face. In self-secure hypocrites who think they fulfill the law, they stir up assumptions and empty confidence in works, and cause them to have contempt for the grace of Christ. On the other hand, they also drive timid consciences to despair. The timid labor with doubt. They can never experience what faith is and how effective it is. So at last, they completely despair. We think about the righteousness of reason like this. God requires it. Because of God's commandment, the honorable works commanded by the Ten Commandments must be done, according to Galatians 3.24. The law was our guardian. Likewise, 1 Timothy 1.9 says, The law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless. For God wants wild sinners to be restrained by civil discipline. To maintain discipline, he has given laws, letters, doctrine, rulers, and penalties. To a certain extent, reason can, by its own strength, perform this civil righteousness. Yet it is often overcome by natural weakness and by the devil pushing it to do obvious crimes. We cheerfully credit this righteousness of reason with the praises that are due it. This corrupt nature has no greater good. Aristotle rightly says, neither the evening star nor the morning star is more beautiful than righteousness, and God also honors it with bodily rewards. However, it ought not to be praised by dishonoring Christ. So it is false that we merit forgiveness of sins by our works. It is false that people are counted righteous before God because of the righteousness of reason. It is false that reason, by its own strength, is able to love God above all things and to fulfill God's law 
In other words, reason cannot truly fear God, be truly confident that God hears prayer, be willing to obey God in death and other divine matters, not covet what belongs to others, and so on. Yet reason can do civil works. The following is also false and dishonoring to Christ. People do not sin who, without grace, do God's commandments. We have testimonies in favor of our belief, not only from the scriptures, but also from the fathers. For in opposition to the Pelagians, Augustine argues at great length that grace is not given because of our merits. In On Nature and Grace, he says, if natural ability through the free will is enough for learning how one ought to live and for living aright, then Christ has died in vain. Then the offense of the cross is made void. Why may I not also cry out about this? Yes, I will cry out, and with Christian grief I will rebuke them. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Galatians 5.4, compare with Galatians 2.21. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Romans 10.4. John 8.36 says, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Therefore, by reason, we cannot be freed from sins and merit forgiveness of sins. In John 3.5, it is written, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But if it is necessary to be born again of the Holy Spirit, the righteousness of reason does not justify us before God and does not fulfill the law. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They totally lack the wisdom and righteousness of God, which acknowledges and glorifies God. Likewise, Romans 8, 7 to 8 says, For the mind is, that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. These testimonies are so clear that, to use Augustine's words in this case, they do not need a keen understanding, but only an attentive hearer. If the carnal mind is hostile against God, the flesh certainly does not love God. If it cannot be subject to God's law, it cannot love God. If the carnal mind is hostile against God, the flesh sins, even when we do outward civil works. If it cannot be subject to God's law, it certainly sins even when it has deeds that are excellent and praiseworthy, according to human judgment. The adversaries consider only the teachings of the second table, which contain civil righteousness, that reason understands. Content with this, they think that they fulfill God's law. In the meantime, they do not see the first table, which commands that we love God, that we declare God is certainly angry with sin, that we truly fear God, that we declare God certainly hears prayer. But the human heart, without the Holy Spirit, either feels secure and despises God's judgment, or, in punishment, flees from God and hates him when he judges. Therefore, it does not obey the first table. So contempt for God, doubt about God's word, and doubt about the threats and promises dwell in human nature. People truly sin, even when, without the Holy Spirit, they do virtuous works. This is because they act with a wicked heart, according to Romans 14.23. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. For such people do their works with contempt for God, just as Epicurus does not believe that God cares for him, or that he is regarded or heard by God. This contempt ruins works that seem virtuous because God judges the heart. And we will continue with that tomorrow evening. Uh, continuing these ar arguments, and then we will talk about what is justifying faith. And that is all coming up tomorrow evening. And for now, we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy, with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time. For behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war, held as slaves and sacrifices of earthly wrath, may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness, and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs, to be ever watchful of the confession of your son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace, that we may withstand all trials, and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, by the patient suffering of your only begotten Son, you have beaten down the pride of the old enemy. Now help us, we humbly pray, to imitate all that our Lord has of his goodness born for our sake, that after his example we may bear with patience all that is adverse to us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.